Uh, chapter 17 is just general guideline because now we're going to be looking at the, the last section of this book. And in this last section, we have about seven chapters. And this general guideline just covers um, what to consider as is working on shiny apps as a software engineer, the things you should put into consideration. So um, improving your software engineering skills is actually going to be a lifelong journey. And um, it's actually going to be in stages. But one thing I got to understand from this chapter is the fact that you should consider it like uh, you keep practicing until you become perfect. I would use the the slides for this presentation because it's more of those words and words on the and we switch from the book to the, the slide generated by the past course. So for 17 just general guidelines, this will be very brief. So for big apps or big teams, there are always new challenges. For this, probably um, the organization of the code, the stability, and also the maintainability. Um, best practices section of the book, software engineering approach and mindsets. So that's what this chapter is actually about. Um, the composition of your code into functions or module. The functions part is what we're going to talk about in chapter 18, which we're also going to be having, which we are going to, we're going to have not talk today, that discussion today. And modules, which is the chapter we'll be taking next, but, and Trevin will be the one to take that chapter. Then we have the organization into packages. So if the, you're building a very, very complex app, then there's high tendency, you might have to make it into a package. Then stability testing. Um, I think this is the part where you might have to come put your 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 codes in the server server side into compartments so it is easy for you to test. And if you're practicing manual testing because of the size of the app, maybe not it's not so um it's not so big or it's not so complex. You can still do the manual testing, but at a point in time you may have to just automate the automated testing. Then um at that back of testing, then security and and performance. These are subsequent chapters we'll get to see as as we go by. I think we have about four chapters left after this, after uh, the next set of chapters. Like, I mean, the next four chapters will cover all of this we just mentioned. Um, for the next thing, software engineering. Uh, at the beginning of this, it's first, I don't understand it. Then you just keep copying and pasting codes. Uh, I think I, experience this and sometimes I still do experience this having to just copy and paste and modify it to suit what I need to get done. And then there are several times I realized that the documentation can just be the lifesaver, going through documentation again and again, taking example codes, how it was how it was done, running it on my system and seeing how this can work with me. This is one other way I have learned like uh, knowledge is power they say so. It's always good when one takes time to go through documentation. Then after a while, well, it gets to a point where you understand this whole thing fluently and you easily could just call it from, you could just write it and it becomes easier. I think if there's one book that really um, pushes the app, this approach is um, uh, Learn Python the Hard Way. I don't know if you've heard of that book here. It's quite an amazing book because the way the author put the book, it, you just have to just practice it. It's just like when you're trying to learn a new thing, it's new. So at first, you just have to just um, practice it until later on it becomes like uh, something you've always been doing. So let's move to the next thing. Um, code organization, empathy. What exactly does empathy stand for? This is actually you writing code. Uh, I think there's a quote in the, in the textbook where, uh, let me just paraphrase, what it actually means is you should write a code that, you should write a code that if another programmer is to check check that same code, you'll be able to understand what you're trying to do, and it will be too complex. I think I should just go straight to the to the book and see exactly the and just okay. Yes, any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Martin Fowler. So I think this is one very important thing you mentioned, and I think some other things that were said at this part of this book was the fact that if you have to write a code, if you have to write code. Try to always name your variables with um, names that are evocative, something that is 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 on the, that can be understood easily. Um, okay, I think these are some guidelines. Are the variable and function names clear and concise? If not, what names would be better? Come would I think there's a typo here? Okay, what names would better? Okay, no, there's no typos. What name would better communicate the intent of the code? Um, 
is it this line? These kids are not spe specific to sign up. Okay, not that line. Okay, so back to this. Do I have comments where we needed to explain complex bit of code? Okay, do I have comment? Do I have comments where I would need to explain complex bit of code? Okay, I think there's a typo there. Um, does this whole function fit on my screen or could it be printed on a single piece of paper? If not, is there a way to break it up into smaller pieces? Am I copying and pasting the same block of code many times throughout my app? If so, is there a way to use a function and be able to avoid repetition? I think um, Hadley Wickham said in one of his presentation, uh, one of the shining presentation one time, I can't really remember the exact talk, or he said something, said if you have to write it um, three times, then I think you should write a function or you should write a, you should write a function for that. And I think he was also even quoting someone else. I think someone else said it, so he was quoting it in Jimmy's talk that very, very, I think he was talking about functional programming also. Okay, so um, all the parts of my application tangled together, or can I manage the different component of my application in isolation? I think when you come to isolation, this is actually the server side of your, of your app. I think this was really buttressed. By the time we go to chapter 18, we'll, we'll talk a bit about, uh, about that because uh, chapter 18 is, is into three sections. We'll get to that soon. There are no silver bullet to address all of these points, and many times they involve subjective judgment calls, but there are two particular important tools. Number one, functions. This allows you to reduce duplication of your UI code, make your server function easier to understand and test, and allow you to more flexibly organize your app code. But for shining models, which we'll be seeing next week, um, this makes it possible to write, to write isolated and reusable code that coordinates front end and back end behavior. Modules allow you to gracefully separate concerns so that individual pages in your application can operate independently or repeated or repeated components no longer need to be copied and, and pasted. So when we talk about functions, we would get to see what, um, how to reduce duplication in your UI code and also the rest of that. Okay, let me go back to this. A function size, copy paste development, shiny functional modules. I think I've just mentioned all of this. Um, to the next one, which is testing. What is a test plan? Okay, back to this. Um, developing a test plan is crucial um, to ensure ongoing stability. Uh, without test plan, every change jeopardizes the application. So when the application is actually small, it, you can actually manually carry out your test. Carrying out this test is to check if um, to check if the app still does what you want it to do. And um, like I said, when your app is small, you can do your test manually. But when it gets bigger, you have to find a way to um, automate your, your testing. Automating the testing can take a long time, but it pays off. Why? Because you can run more tests um, at a go. You can like do a whole lot at, in a short time. Automation takes time to set up but it pays off over time because you can run tests more frequently. For this reason, various forms of automated tests have been developed for Shiny, as outlined in chapter 21, which we'll get to see some other time. And at that chapter, we explain you can develop, okay, this is just like preparing our mind for what is what is in chapter 21. Unit testing that confirms the correct behavior of an individual function, integration test to confirm the interaction between the actives, functional test to validate the end-to-end -end experience from a browser, Load test to ensure that the application can withstand the amount of traffic you anticipate for, for it. Um, the beauty of writing an automated test is that you, that once you have taken the time to write it, you will never need to manually test that portion of your application again. You can even let the continuous integration. I think continuous integration, you can have multiple um, tests being carried out at the same time. So once you see the green, the green means go that, okay, those codes actually do exactly what you want them to do. And if not, it uh, doesn't. I think this is one part I hope to get to. Um, dependency management, if you've ever tried to re reproduce some analysis uh, written by someone else, yes, this part, um, this is where the REM, the REM package is actually important. What is REM that reproduce our environment? So sometimes um, when you're checking your old codes, I think this is me summarizing what is here. When you're checking your old codes, um, there are some, if you um, installed certain packages when you ran, ran those codes in the past, if you're to run them again two, three years after, there's high tendency most of those packages that you 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 used to um, to run those codes might have been update, updated, or the packages may have been changed, the versions may have changed, and what that means is those codes may not run. Maybe if a an argument has been made 
maybe a, a function has been made into an argument. Something might have changed. And this means that you might have to spend a whole lot of time debugging, finding out oh, what could possibly have gone wrong and what other functions can meet this um, can meet this need. And another tool for managing dependencies is the config package. I think I mentioned the first one, which is the rent and the rent and package. Um, another one is the config package. The config does, doesn't actually manage dependency itself, but it does provide a convenient place for you to track and manage dependencies other than our packages. Um, okay, this, uh, for instance, you might have specified a part of a CSV file that your application depends on, or the URL of an API that you require. Having this enumerated in the config file gives you a single place where you can track and manage these dependencies. Um, let me go back to this and continue with this. Okay, I think I've mentioned what it, why test plan, what the test plan is. Um, what does testing, how, why does testing improve stability of an app? Um, automation and versus manual test, test type, unit integration, functional load. I think I mentioned that. Testing behavior, testing components. Can you have too many tests? I don't think so. Um, that's the importance of automation. Automation makes that possible. Okay, we have four participants. Beautiful. Hi, everyone. Hi, Trevor. Okay. Um, to the next one. Dependency management. I think I just talked about this. Bev. And, okay. Another message. Hello. Okay. Okay, so um, I think we also have Docker and section info, the config package. Are there different produce requirements? An app versus an analysis project. Um, when should when should you have different configuration for an app? The file system as part of the environment. I think I mentioned something about that. Maybe not. And in the production environments, you connect the app to the reproduction database. Okay. For example, if your application analysis analysis anal analyzes a database with lots of data, you might choose to configure a few different environments. In the production environment, you connect the app to the reproduction database. In the test environment, you configure the app to use a test database so that you can you properly exercise the database connection in your test, but you don't risk the corrupt corrupting your production database if you accidentally need to change that corrupts the data. In development, you might configure the application to use a small CSV with a subset of data to allow for faster iterating. I think this example is if your application analyzes a database with lots of data, you might choose to configure a few different environments. So this three environments makes it possible for you to know, okay, what you, like put this whole thing, these three processes makes it possible for you to have something concrete to put out there so you don't end up um, having a challenge when you are finally um, putting out your app as a production. Lastly, be wary of making an assumption about the local file system. If your code has a reference to data, C, data, cars, or CSV, or my project gens, uh, gens to RDS, for example, you need to realize that it's very unlikely that these files will exist on another computer, which is true, because this actually means that these are local files on your system. Instead, use a path relative to the app directory, like data, cars, or CSV, or gens RDS, or use the config package to make the external part explicit and configurable. So that said, said about that source code management. So this is actually for people who have been developing, who have, who have been into, uh, well, developers, long-term developers. So um, you can re rely on version control system um, such as JIT, and um, we should start with here the JIT org. Um, so you can use JIT to report. And so whenever you push your code out there and if, there, if there's any change, you can go back there to check and do the necessary things and you can track back any change you've made in, in, in the long run. Um, continuous integration, I think this is when, um, once you're using a version control system and have a robust set of automated tests, um, this is actually a good way to validate the changes you are making to your application and to ensure that you have not broken anything. I think that is all about, that is almost all, okay. Code reviews, I think I mentioned something related to this earlier. Um, when, you have your code reviewed by someone else if it is well written um, in such a way that another person can understand what you've written. You could easily check and um, make corrections, debug for you, and also um, anyone going through your code could learn a thing or two, maybe how um, you how you're able to like put your functions together to get a certain task done. 
And um, it also facilitates cross pollination. For example, you're working on something and somebody else needs to also um, do something related to that or um, add to what you've done. It's easier for everyone to understand what you're doing. And um, the resulting conversation often improves the reliability of your code. So code reviews are very important. Have, having people like experience the developers look at what you've done, they can suggest what you need to do, and you too can also read other people's code to understand what needs to be done. So yeah, if you questions, we don't do anything codes. The new functions have concise but evocative names. Are they part of the code you find confusing? What areas are likely to change in the future and would particularly benefit from automated, automated testing? The style of the code match the rest of the app. Uh, I think, yes, this one is also important. If the code doesn't match, maybe the um, documented, the groups documented code style, then there might be a need to change something or so. If you're, if you're embedded in an organization with a strong engineering culture, setting up a code to be for data science code should be relatively straightforward and you have existing tools and things to draw on. And this is also beautiful when you have that group or that team you work with or you're working on a team, it makes it easier because that culture will just be part of, um, will make it easier for you to understand what's going on. And um, there are two resources here, which we can actually go back and check after now and draw more knowledge from. So in summary, um, this is just a bit of what a software engineer mindset could be about, which uh, includes um, you empathy, writing code that other people can understand. Uh, according to the, 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 one of the quotes the author mentioned in the book, as had the weekend, he said, um, any fool can write a, a code that a computer can, can run. But um, humans write, um, let me quickly go back there, sorry. Uh, but, um, any fool can write code that a computer can understand, but good programmers write code that humans can understand. Okay, so with that, I think we'll come to the end of chapter 17 and we'll be going straight to chapter 18. I don't know if anyone has any question or maybe there's um, anything you want to add or something you want to say or anyone? Not at the moment. Okay. No question, all good so far, oh, great. So we'll move to chapter 18 functions. Um, anyone who has gone through the advanced um, R book, uh, Trevin, I think you would have, you should have a whole lot to contribute in this chapter. Um, would have seen that about, we would have seen it in also about functions or, um, I think on top of functions, chapter 18, yes. Yeah. So what's the learning objective of this chapter? Um, like in our analysis, functions can be useful in shiny applications to improve the functionality, to improve the functionality optimization, to improve functionality optimization and make code cleaner or quicker to debug. Uh, so what's the learning objective of this um, chapter? Number one, so learn how to use functional programming techniques to make many controls at once. Number two, to understand how to use functions with reactive in the server. Number three, three, walk through some use cases where functions may be appropriate. So the outline of this chapter is in three phases. We have file organization, number one. Number two, UI function, and the third one is server function. So now we we'll move to file organization. So I would go back to the book. Is there something I wrote down or let's stay here? Okay, for file organization, we put larger functions and their helper functions into their own R. Um, you can have the function name, I think. Um, yes, this. You can have it like a function name dot R file. Like you just have this, the last function and other smaller helper functions together in one R file. So um, in this way, your, your, your codes are, are put together and you're able to you're able to have everything in the clean process it makes it easy for you to look at what you need to to get done so um another place you can put your your um your functions is um you might want to collect smaller simpler functions into one place i often use the r utils.r for this but if they're primarily used in your ui you might use r um slash ui that are um file so if you made an r package before you might notice that shiny uses the same convention for storing files containing function well i've not made an r package before i look forward to 
And indeed, if you are making it complicated, particularly if there are multiple authors, there's substantial advantage to make a full-fledged package. So if this, if you're making a shiny app that's a complex one and it's involved a lot of authors, it's advisable to actually um, make a package. So uh, I think the author, Alwikam is actually recommending the engineering shiny book and also the accompanying Golem package. I think that is um, calling fair, I think calling fair with that. Um, and clear the authors. UI functions. This is a this is a section in this book, and that's caught my attention. It was interesting. Um, functions are power, powerful too because they reduce duplication in the UI code. This is actually one of the most important um, uses of function: reduce duplication and um, makes what you're doing more efficient. Um, so let's start with this example. So I would switch to my R screen to so R Studio now. Can you see my R Studio? No, not yet. It's still the book. Okay. Is it visible now? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so for the first uh for the first uh use case that we have, um UI as for the first use case that we have here, we UI function. We have is first okay, sorry for that. Okay, so we have um our user interface having four slider inputs. And each of the slider inputs ha has um, their ha several arguments about three, four, five, five, six, seven, six arguments, UI, uh, the ID name, the uh, minimum, maximum, and the likes like that. So um, this is just one way that this can be done. To run this, we'll still get, we'll still get the same output. But, it's better when we don't have to duplicate writing this four times. We could just have a function that houses all of this. And that's why we have this here. Okay, no, no, no. And this, there's an app running in the background. Stop this. Okay, is a message. Trevin said yes. Okay. I think that was the question I asked earlier. So we could have something totally different. And what is that? We could just have a function for the slider input, whereby we have um, just one slider input function having all of it, the ID, the label, and all the arguments. But we know that the ID is also what the label is. And so that's why this is like this. And then the function ID, the function ID, this argument here is the only argument that um, the function we are creating would be having. We are, create, we are creating slider input O1 function. The slider input O1 function has the argument ID. The argument ID is what is, um, is the only difference in all of the, the functions that we will write in the UI, in the UI, in the UI, um, in the UI side. And that's why we have these four functions here. But this time around, we have different IDs alpha, beta, gamma, data. So if we were to run this, um, let me share this, there. Okay. okay. So I'm going to my screen. Hello? Yes. So we have the four sliders here and you see they do work. So back to the back to the text. So we just checked all of this and we would have the same output for both both um, this part here and also this part here. Okay. 
Uh, I can see it now. Sorry, I can only type today. Oh, no problem, Trevin. It's fine. Other applications. Functions can be used in many other places. Yeah, a few ideas to get the creative juice flowing. Um, if you're using date input and um, for your country, I think this part we we have this example that um, that makes it possible for us to have more arguments in a function just because we add the ellipses, like having this three dot here. It means that okay, if we have other arguments that we would want our function to take in, this covers for it. Because many other arguments you feel you would want to include, you can include them. Um, so this example just has, this example has, gives that, makes that possibility. Just an example to show us that this is actually possible. Then we have this with the radio button that makes it easy to provide icons. And in a case where we have, if there are multiple selections, you use in multiple places. We can have also this. If you have to make multiple selections, we can also have this, and you can be able to add as much function, as much um, arguments you as you as you would like to add um, in, in the system. So there's a lot of shiny app putting organization. It can help improve cross app consistency by putting functions like this in a shared package. So having one package containing all of all functions like this in one package, it makes it easy for you to um, um, Call out the functions because they're all in one in one package. Functional programming. Um, I think there are several videos on YouTube by um, um, thought process leaders as we get um, how functional programming works. Um, it's one of the packages for this is actually poor, and um, one um, very popular function there is the map function. We can actually re reduce the code further if we are actually using the um, functional programming approach. Because what the functional programming approach does is, it's like when you're using the, it's like when you're running a for loop of some sort, I think, yes. Uh, for example, um, it's just like when you're using LApply, but it's, it's like, it's much more interesting using the map function. So uh, in this case, we have, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, which was the ID, um, which was the um, ID in the last uh, in the last um, example we looked at on the R Studio. This is it here. So this time around, what we are trying to do now is that we want to make sure that all of this would run as um, elements of this object vars by this function. Okay, we know that the slider impute O1 function um, is a function written, is an helper function written that contains the slider input function itself. So what we're trying to do now is we want the slider impute O1 function to run across each of the elements in the object bars. And uh, the fluid row is just like a, a, a HTML container that would run all of this, would run all of this, um, elements in the object vars into the slider input O1 function. And in so doing, we will still get the same output as we got earlier. Let's just quickly um, check that in our studio. Okay, so this is it here. Just stop and Run. So if you notice in our UI side, it's just like one line of code. Every other thing that we're trying to do on the UI side has already been done outside the um, outside the, the UI or even the server. So it's like we have everything done outside and it makes, makes it look neater and um, much more elegant. So if we run the app, we have the same, we have the same output the four sliders, just like before. And they are operational. So back to the, back to the chapter. And, okay. Okay, to know more about the map function, you can actually check functional chapter in the advanced hour book. I think I mentioned this before. And, um, 
there's there's another there's another function I think as the pmap function, and I think this is the part where I really yeah okay, this is it UI as data. I think this part really got me. I really was um. Uh, I think I was quite excited when I saw this part of the of the um the use case. I was so excited. It's like you're using the UI as 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 data. So say we have the table. So each of these table is like the arguments of the function. ID, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, minimum, zero, zero. These are just um, arguments that we are going to run in the function. So we have just the same thing here. And this time around, we're using pmap. So the difference between the map function and the pmap function is that the map function of the um, of the pull package would run, would run, would work with like specified vector to so that you so that you supply a function to the map. Okay, let's take. Let me take. Let me. Let me okay, let me take a deep breath. In the map function that we used here earlier, where is it? Yes, this is it. Yeah, we supply this function here to vars and vars pick each of the elements in this object, like this vars object. This the vars object. The elements in vars objects were were acted upon by the function singly. Alpha gets his own treatment, beta gets his own treatment, gamma gets his own treatment, delta gets his own treatment of the slider input O1, based on my understanding, what I understand. But for PMAP, what PMAP does, PMAP does it? PMAP will not relate with a vector. PMAP will relate with the list, with a list. So it will pick each vector in the list and would apply the slider input function on each of those vectors in the list. So like, so there's like pmap works with pmap works with list, why map works with um vectors. I don't know if there's anyone who has something contrary or something more wants to like elucidate or see something more about that. Uh anyone? Let's do it. Uh, okay, no one is saying anything. So right, move on. So um at this point. PMAP would run on this vase here, which is like a table, and it will run on uh, to use each of these column names and it will run and would get the same thing. So let me show that in our studio. Okay, um, that's this. Stop sharing. Yeah, for the difference, and you see for the difference, I think I have saw this. I think this is for the difference. Um, this is it. Let's run this on app. Okay. We share. We still get the same thing. It still runs just like just like every other just like every other um, every other thing we've, we've done in the past. So um, UI as a data. Um, the first time I had that encounter of seeing UI as a data was um, when I saw uh, an app that was still in you know, it was, it was still work in progress. And they had um, most of the data in the most of data in an AWS server, and they just put, 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 they have most of the data there, and they just pick this data and use it to create the UI. And it, at first, I didn't get what was going on, but when I was going to this chapter, I know it's like I'm beginning to understand exactly what they, these guys were doing and how it was working because then I was still so amazed, like how is Shiny able to do all this? How was this working working? I think that was what really propelled me to even come to, to want to read this and really understand um, how Shiny really, really works. So um, back to the book. Back to the book, yep. I guess I'm still sharing the book. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, 
So I think that's that. Um, for now, if this still looks a bit confusing, um, I just want uh, I think the auto, as we can say, you can continue to use copy and paste, but in the long run, I recommend learning more about functional, functional programming because it gives you such a wonderful ability to concisely express otherwise long-winded concept. Um, so, so for more examples of units that can generate dynamic UI in response to user action. Okay, uh, we can always check this example. Let's see, let's see what this example is. Okay, let's check the photo. Let's just see. Dynamic UI, okay. Um, UI output using render UI. Um, okay, okay. Okay, so okay. Um, So we could still come back and check this and um, get to understand more about what this is all about. So, so server function. So according to the author, as we can, he was advising that if we have a long reactive, say more than 10 lines, we should consider pulling it out into a separate function that does not use any reactivity. Now this has two advantage. One, it is easier to debug and also test the code. If you can fashion it so that the activity lives inside of server and complex computation lives in your function. So it's good when you let the complex computation live in the function and you let the activity live in the server. With that, it's easier to actually test. It's easier, it's easier to actually easier to test and it's also easier to to um to debug. And um when looking at the reactive expression output, there's no way to easily tell exactly what values it depends on, except by carefully reading the code block. A function definition, however, tells exactly what the inputs are. So this is another reason why function, a function will be highly, highly appreciated when working. The key benefit of the function the UI tends to be around reducing duplication. We, we've seen that. But in Sava, we know that it's more about isolation and testing. In the server side, it's more about isolation and, and testing. So creating functions in server side is just to, it makes it easy for us to isolate and also to, to test reading uploaded data. So this is a use a, a case study or there's a use case that we'll be looking at. And this example is actually picked from chapter nine. We have a complex reactive here. And this reactive is about um, reading uploaded data. And this uploaded data can come in two forms as a CSV, comma separated value file, or as a TSV, tab separated value file. And also, we have a function that validates if the file matches the above, requir the above requirements. Without further ado, go into this. So, um, looking at this, the author actually was suggesting that we could reduce this reactive. We use the reactive. We could break, take out function. We could make a function out, out out of this. And how do we do that? We could make a function called load file, and this function contains two arguments: the name and the path. And after creating this function, we we'll see exactly what happened to the reactive. So it becomes very, 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 very like it contains less code. Let me say very, very light. Let me use the word light. So now we have just the reactive having two lines of code, just two lines of code, compared to earlier that I had about, I think, eight, one, two, three, four, five, okay, let's say six, about six lines of code. And this actually means that it has been reduced drastically, and whatever. And whoever needs to, maybe if there's any challenge, whoever needs to look at this code, we know exactly what to do to, to correct it. Uh, can quickly check that in the R Studio because I have that also. So, uh, I can do that side by side. You know, big more. Um, Okay. 
dividing this uh, 3.1 Okay. Mm -hmm. So is my R still visible? Um, it's the book. Okay, I think I will just share both of them at the same time. I think both of them are visible now. Yeah, side by side. Okay, great. Okay, so this is the app for the initial code that we have here, um, the server function include output session, um, data and everything there. So let's run this. Okay. We would get this to run and it would work. We could actually um, if you say this uh, FIFA CSV and voila, we have our table and we have we can decide to switch the number of rows or and we get something in return. Well, if we go back to um, sorry, if we go back to the to the uh, to the the um, the updated the updated version of the same code uh, the functioned version of the same code we have the load file function here having to argument name and path and this time around we have the function outside of the chain version of the UI or the server side and with this we have a less a less um, and let's walk you our server side and we can have the same outputs, making it even easier for us to debug the code. Anyone could look at it and say, okay, what's going on here? Um, and if there's a need for something to change, they can easily, yes. So we also have, we have this and we can even make changes. I think this is super, super helpful. And I think we'll get to even see more and see how beautiful this whole thing works when we look at um, modules. Because in modules, you can compartmentalize your 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 codes, and the, and it's it's it makes your work even easier. You can have data manipulation in a different R scripts. You can have uh, many things in just different scripts, and you just bring everything into the the. Um, the app in the long run. So uh, I think we're, we're done with this user case. Um, let's just quickly say what this is. When you're striking out such helpers, okay, yes, let me mention this. Avoid taking reactive as input or returning output. Instead, pass values into argument and assume the caller will, will turn the result into a reactive if needed. This isn't a hard and fast tool. Sometimes it will make sense for your functions to input or output reactive, but generally, I think it's better to keep the reactive and non-reactive part of your app as separate as possible. In this case, I am still using the validate function. Okay, this part is using the validate function, which works similarly as a stop function. Why is he using it? He's using it to actually validate. Okay, if the above requirement is not meant, send this message. Inval um, invalid file, please upload it.csv or a.csv file. And um, I think this works there. It means elegant. So this will actually keep our server side elegant and whoever sees it will be able to quickly debug if there's anything that needs to be done. So now to the internal functions. Most of the time you would want to make the functions completely independent of the server function. And so that you can put in a separate file. However, if the function needs to use input, output, or session, it makes sense for the function to live inside the server function. So if the function you are actually writing for the server side would, if the, the function you are writing would need to use the input or output or session, it's best to keep it inside the server function. It's best to stay in the server function so we don't have that challenge. So we have two um, use cases here that actually specify what that is all about. And um, the function is a switch page function. 
uh, I think we touched on this, and I, I, if I can remember clearly, Lucia was one in, I think Lucia was one who um, showed us something about this then. And we have this two great examples here, yeah? and we can switch pages and and we can observe the page switch. I think um, page, I actually didn't want this. Uh, I was thinking we will be out of time for, by, by the time we'll be going through this too. So I didn't want this too. I don't have these two examples here on my R studio. Um, but I think what this, what this does is, um, um, most times you might want to take the function completely independent of the star function so that you can put it in a separate file. However, I think I mentioned it, if it needs to use the input output extension, it makes sense to leave it inside the star function. So it doesn't make testing or debugging any easier, but it does reduce duplicate code, reduce duplicated code in. Um, we could use, we could of course add session to the arguments of the function. At this point, I wasn't really clear what the, um, what Halloween was saying here because I didn't see session being add session to the argument of the function. I didn't see session being added to the argument of the function. I said maybe I really didn't understand what he was saying here. I don't know if anyone could um, help out and make sense out of this, please. Anyone? Yeah, it wasn't clear to me as well. Okay. But for example, uh, when we saw that a specific function update the set panel, okay. Uh, in the examples, we didn't use session either, and it did work. But okay. when when I tried to run the code again uh, in another time, uh, it didn't work, and it seems that for those type of update functions, uh, mm -hmm. for shiny inputs, you do need to use the session the session argument, and you do something like. So wait, uh, if I get. If I get you clearly, where would the session argument be here? I, that's what I don't read. What's not clear to me? Where would the session argument be? Uh, because you're using an input for for update tab set panel. Okay. Okay. So you have to pass something like I think it was reactive domain, something like that. I, I, I should say in the chat. I don't remember I don't remember like that name of okay. the function that you use for the session parameter. For these okay. type of update functions, but I, I suppose that they mean that you can also pass uh, that default uh, value of session into the switch page function because it, it, it is in the session object as well for the update types of panel. Okay, 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 so I think. Um... Does anybody else want to contribute to say something? Okay, like Trevin said he can only type today. How about you, Lydia? Oh, I didn't get to read the chapter ahead of time, so oh, okay, not too okay. sure. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. It's fine. Fine. Uh, so in summary, as your app gets bigger, extracting non-reactive functions. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, Lucia. Okay, um, as you have get bigger, extracting non-reactive functions out of the flow of the app will make your life substantially easier. Functions allow you to, you to allow you to react to. Uh, there's a whole lot of allow you to reactive and non-reactive code. Functions allow you to use reactive and non-reactive code and spread your code out over multiple files. This also makes it much easier to see the big picture shape of your app and then moving complex logic out of the app into regular R code. It makes it much easier to experiment, iterate, and test. When you, set, when you start extracting our function, it's likely to feel a bit slow and frustrating. So that's why it could take like months to complete the Shiny app project. Uh, but over time, you get faster. And that is why I think practice makes perfect. And for me, I love the fact that I'm taking these smaller steps and I know I would get good we we'll get more into sessions next week with modules. Yes, yes, yes. So Trevin, we'll be expecting so much for you. There's one chapter really I look forward to in the whole of this book is chapter 19, modules. I think um, Emily Reinder said something about it in the last Shiny conference. 
Um, the, and this function in this chapter have one important drawback. It can generate only UI or server components, not only UI or server components, not both. In, in the next chapter, you will learn how to create shiny modules, which coordinates UI and server code into a single object. To be honest, um, if there's one thing I want all of us to look forward to, um, the shiny modules, it's it's like it's like one of the best chapter in the whole of this book. Uh, it's just beautiful chapter. And um, I really look forward to all of us being there. Uh, same over here. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I am not the only one who has that feeling. So um, it's it's just so beautiful because you can have an R script, you do your data manipulation in one R script, and you can test all the things you need. Maybe test the visual, what you want the visual to look like, and the rest like that. Then you come back into your, you have a separate app or R file, or you could even have it split. It. You have your UI or R file and your your um your searching the R file. Then you just keep doing your thing and. Well, I have not gotten, uh, I'm not, I'm not really, really there yet. I'm still working on myself. I've met some other um, shiny developers that are really, really so good. And I know that many of you are also very good. So I know you have been humble, but I know that with time, we get to still see how we get to learn more from each other. So I want to say thank you for this opportunity to be able to present this chapter today. And we look forward to shiny modules, um, trying to present the shiny modules. I know that discussion would be amazing because I really look forward to it. Shiny modules. Um, without, um, I don't know if anyone has any contribution or any words to say, or you want to type something in the chat box. I would gladly say, say it. And, and thank you so much for your time. Um, if there's no comments, okay. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Nothing from you, Trevin. Okay, now you're on Trevin. I uh, really look forward to listening to you uh, next week. Um, if we have nothing more to say, you know, say thank you guys for coming around. I look forward to all of us being together to the end of this um, book club, I mean, this particular uh, book we're going through. And um, thank you so much. And um, see everyone next week. Oh, yes. Yeah, see you too, Trevin. I was so excited for next week. Thank you. See you next, everyone. Yes. Super excited for next week too. Thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Ciao. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you next week.